Ciao, welcome to Celebrating Culture. I'm coming to you from the American Italian Cultural Center in New Orleans, Louisiana. As you come in the museum, it tells the story of the immigration of over 60,000 Sicilians into New Orleans. In fact, if you're from Sicily, there's a screen and you can put in your last name and it'll tell you what part of the island your family originated. Our episodes showcase the dedication of the Sicilian immigrants into New Orleans and how they went from immigrants to contributors to leaders over the span of about 100 years. We'll start at the Mississippi River at the Monument to the Immigrant, which shows a family arriving to start a new life in America. Hi, welcome to Celebrating Culture. We're here with Franco Alessandrini, who's an artist in New Orleans, who's also Italian, and it's great to have him on the show as he's in town. Franco, welcome to the show. Thank you, thank you. So tell me, what brings you to New Orleans from Italy? I love the city. New Orleans in Italy is pretty much like Florence, where I come from, is full of art. Talk about figurative art, sculpture and painting. In New Orleans also is a lot of art, a lot of artists, a lot of writers, and mostly music. The art of music and the art of painting, I think, is a, is a wonderful combination. You've got two great sculptures here in New Orleans, the Monument to the Immigrant and the Monument to the Pope. The Monument to the Immigrant is iconic. It's on the waterfront. How did you envision that? That was a commission from the Italian community. So when I got this commission, I start trying to figure out how to express the feeling of immigration in New Orleans. And I started reading and looking at pictures and so on. I realized that the best thing for me to do was just to recreate the one photograph of these people stepping down from the ship and let them tell you the story, tell you how they felt and the way you feel. The so hope, when the you fears. Look, when you look at them, uh, you can possibly try to figure out what they felt. Then you've done another one since, the Pope. Yeah, the Pope was a, was a wonderful experience. Mr. Frank Mazzelli commissioned me to do the Pope. Then while I was doing the Pope, there was the possibility for the Pope to bless the statue, and he did. You know, we mm -hmm. went to the, St. Peter's Square, yes. and uh, the Pope came out, and I thought he would have probably blessed from far away. You know, like, <laughs> and so he came over there, he touched the statue and all that, and he started to Frank and all that. So it was a wonderful experience. In New Orleans, you, you're doing seafood, the fish, the oysters. Before the work, uh, in 1970, I started doing silk screen poster for the Festa d'Italia. At the time, it was pretty big. And then during the uh, warfare, I was the artist in residence at the Italian village. And I did the Louisiana alphabet, which became the official alphabet of the state of Louisiana made it by the governor, so that was a very big thing. Yes. So it's very important. Now, I also see in your paintings, you love music, there's energy. Futurism, cubism have been called, but I mean, it's, you have a special style. You know, jazz basically is a classic form of, of music, which then he has a lot of improvisation, interpretation, right? And my painting is the same thing. It's very, basically, it's a very classic thing, but there is a lot of improvisation, a lot of, try to recreate it, like the music, the sound, try to recreate the, uh, the motion and uh, the feeling of uh, the musician. So this is a combination of things. Then the people can call them, uh, you know, futurism, uh, whatever you want to call it, it's okay. But it's, uh, it's like, uh, you know, in New Orleans, it's, it's funky like this. We could call it jazzism. <laughs> yeah, jazz, something <laughs> like that. You know, in jazz, one of my favorite jazz musicians is Nick LaRocca. And mine too. <laughs> so what, what are your thoughts about Nick? We have to recognize that he's the first person who recorded a jazz record before anybody else. Did, so yes. that's, that's a history. You can only erase that. And he was really, um, as we know, a classic trained musician. He loved opera, you know, he used to be working at the opera house yes. as an electrician. And Nick's dad actually brought over a trumpet when he came over from Sala Peruta, Italy. His dad, he loved music, but when uh, Nick tried to play, he broke two or three trumpets because he never wanted for him to play. <laughs> so not many people, he smashed three trumpets. And he, he, you know, trumpet, he paid with his own money, but he was working hard, tried to to buy a trumpet and his father ate the fact that he wanted to become a musician because it's not really, not you don't make any money. You know, you lose, you waste your time, you go to work. Okay. And this is what happened. 
But you know, I guess he was, uh, he really loved music so much that he stick with it. So Franco, where is your art located? My art located mostly, like I said, in the United States and in Italy, where um, I have some monument and also some sculpture in different private collection and painting and graphic work. I understand you have a website and it's francoalessandriniart.com. And people can go there to find out where your sculptures are. And you've got some in Texas, Louisiana, yeah. and in Italy. And then there's a private studio in New Orleans. I have a private studio in Italy too. I have a gallery over there which has a permanent collection of my work. And there's one in Fort Worth too. So there's a place where you can see my work. Oh, wonderful. I want to thank you for being on the show. Thank you. Thank you very much. And stay tuned. We'll be right back with more of Celebrating Culture. Welcome to Celebrating Culture. This episode is in Little Palermo at the Hotel Richelieu with Carol Campo and Jerry Sinner. Carol, Jerry, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. Thank you. Well, the Richelieu Hotel has 90 rooms. We have a little cafe which serves breakfast and lunch and a bar that's open mostly till midnight, sometimes later when there's a big crowd. A lot of locals come here still to dine and have a cocktail. It's a really nice end of the French Quarter. It's quiet, just has a lot of character. Who stayed here? We've had Ray Charles, we've had Paul McCartney stayed here for a long time, twice for a very long time. They would lay out by the pool, nobody would bother him. I didn't even know they were here because my dad wouldn't tell me because he said I would blab to all of his friends. Of course. And then he wouldn't have any peace. This end of the quarter was very quiet and gave him their privacy. And it was an unknown, I guess, common knowledge that a lot of stars would stay here and nobody would bother them. So, it, you know, people were used to seeing stars around, hanging around a lot of the music industry, a lot of the movie industry. Well, Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie's house backs up to our parking lot. So they would come in, they would stroll through the lobby every now and then. Actually, Brad Pitt wanted my dad to put a gate so that he could get from his house into our parking lot, kind of like a little back entrance sure, to so escape the paparazzi. <laughs> Before, there was a hotel, there was a macaroni factory. The macaroni factory, which is now the biggest part of the Richelieu, was formed in 1902. And it ran until 1939 when the Cusimanas sold it to a furniture company, which the furniture company later turned into a mattress factory. And then in 1963, Sam Rosselli bought it and turned it into a hotel. It was the largest macaroni factory in the U.S. Big Udo family here, they started the Progresso label. big Tusa family that ran Central Grocery yeah. still runs it today over a hundred years. I remember going there as a child and there would be bins of live snails and bins of beans and it was just so cool. They had all kind of salami, pepperoni and cheeses hanging up. It was such a fascinating place. It was like being in Italy. My kids hated to go in there because the fish, what they called the bacala, yes. it was that dried fish in the barrels and it had an odor, and, uh, and my kids would walk in holding their nose until they left. <laughs> that smells in their dead. <laughs> I think I did the same thing when I was a kid. I remember, the, I remember seeing that bacala. I, I didn't know if it smelled bad, but I remember seeing that dead fish. It was dead yeah. and dried, and I thought that was so strange. How would you cook that, you know? But my mother's neighbor would buy it and cook it, and it's like, I don't want to eat that. <laughs> And the snails, my, you know, she would go and buy the snails and they would have to purge them in a pot of salted water. And I was being cute one day and my friend said, look what my mom is cooking, you know? And I left the top cracked and the next morning the snails were all over the kitchen on the ceiling, oh my the gosh. walls, my mom was furious. Oh. <laughs> I mean, even just 20 years ago, I was eating ice cream at Bricotta's. And they not only had ice cream, they had all the pastries, the cookies, those wonderful fig cookies and sesame seed cookies that you can't get anywhere else. They still make those. But New Orleans people, we like to keep it old. We don't like change. We don't like the big box places. You know, we like the 
the oldness. Hi, we hope you've enjoyed this episode of Celebrating Culture. Awe News has interviewed hundreds of people and produced dozens of episodes for local broadcasting. Awesome people doing great things to inspire us all. If you'd like to watch a specific interview, please visit our YouTube channel and subscribe. Hi, welcome back to Celebrating Culture. We're here today with John Viola at the Italian Piazza in New Orleans. The fountain is shaped like the map of Italy. Actually, it even includes Sicily, and it's a great way to talk about the history of unification of Italy. John, welcome to the show. Good to be here. Now, you've had a phenomenal career promoting Italian culture. What are the highlights of that? I am, like, I think the last professional Italian-American. I've been in every organization around the country, from the Italian-American Sports Hall of Fame in Chicago to the Italian-American Cultural Institute in D.C., and then six years as the president and COO of the National Italian-American Foundation in Washington. And today, I'm running an institution called the Italian American Experience. We're going to talk about Garibaldi, who yeah. must be the great grand marshal of all of Italy, right? Basically, yeah, I think that's how they hold him. <laughs> Garibaldi had fought his way through so many liberation wars throughout South America, and obviously in Italy, and in 1848, at the beginning of the European rebellions, Garibaldi is in Rome for the short-lived Roman Republic, and this idea of unifying Italy from the ancient capital and bringing liberal democratic values to New Italy and obviously he, he loses that war and ends up uh, fleeing and comes to the United States for a, a while and lives in uh, my hometown in New York on Staten Island. When Garibaldi is finally able to come back to Italy as Italy begins to ferment towards unification, he leaves from Genova with a few volunteers, makes his way down eventually to Marsala, Sicily on the west coast and leads his what would become a thousand volunteers, his famous red shirts, which yeah. I see you dressed in today. today yeah. Yeah. And he leads them all the way through Sicily and up through the tip of the boot in Calabria and eventually to Naples to become the dictator of the Kingdom of Two Sicilies and eventually hand it to the Piedmontese army that's fighting in the north to unify the two halves of the peninsula for the first time since Roman times. Everywhere he went, everywhere he spoke, he was seen as a great fighter for liberty and human rights. You know, there's a, there's a cookie named after him in England. I mean, he was a celebrity there, he was a celebrity in the United States. And I think Lincoln, seeing this unfortunate march towards war and secession, decides it would be a great coup both militarily and from a PR sense to have Garibaldi come and lead his troops. And so he actually sends him an offer letter. So the, the war in America had started around May of 1861. By September of 1861, and Lincoln really doesn't have the right general yet either, yeah. he gets word to Garibaldi, I want you to come lead the army. Yeah, it's pretty amazing to think that he would, we have such a history of military leadership in this country. All of these great soldiers from West Point, and obviously many of them are fighting for the South because they're from here. And so I think it's Lincoln's attempt to really shift the paradigm and he goes overseas and goes to Garibaldi and Garibaldi essentially receives this letter with a real offer for a commission as a major general. Because he's in such high demand, he really takes his time and sort of sends back a very loaded answer. He sends back an answer set with conditions, one of which is he needs the full command of the Union forces. Garibaldi always had his own way of fighting and never liked to answer to another leader. And if he's going to do that, he's going to be the, the leader of the full force and it's going to be a war declared for the abolishment of slavery, which it hasn't been at that point. Now, Lincoln had been very clear in March when he took office that, that, that he was not gonna abolish slavery, that the Constitution didn't allow him. Yeah. And he was actually in the early stages, they were returning captured slaves to the Southerners who they captured him from. Yeah, I mean, people oftentimes boil down the Civil War into this very oversimplified idea of freedom versus slavery. It really wasn't. The abolition was a popular movement in the Union in the years prior to secession, but it was in no way a declared objective of war in the early stages. And Garibaldi makes that compact, that, that condition, part of what would bring him over here. And of course, Lincoln can't meet it at that point. And so he ends up staying in Italy. About a year goes by and then Lincoln issues the Emancipation Proclamation, and that does change the scope of the war. Sure, sure does. So, yeah. so we don't know if Garibaldi planted that seed, but it's, it is about a year in advance that he's talking about it before Lincoln figures out how to make slavery and, and the end of slavery part of the war. It's always fascinating for me to think because, you know, our community here in, in the 20 millions of us that are here now really draw our ancestry to the years after the Civil War when Italy uh, sees this great migration out of the South primarily. So I, I often feel like we don't necessarily have a, a sense of historical attachment to the revolution and the founding and the Civil War. But in fact, if you 
really do dig down at the core of so many of our values is uh, Mazzini's idea of all men being created equal, Garibaldi's insistence that this is a fight for freedom and equality. Uh, they are Italian, the best of Italian yeah, ideas. They are. Italians have contributed greatly to American philosophy and politics. He was talking about Philip Mazzai, who wrote to Thomas Jefferson and said, all men are created equal. In fact, John F. Kennedy confirmed this when he wrote a book, A Nation of Immigrants. At the same time, a gentleman named Gaetano Filangiari was writing to Benjamin Franklin, and he said America should be a country of free trade, freedom of speech, and freedom of religion. Garibaldi does actually help to use his popular image to muster a troop in New York called the Garibaldi Guard. Yes. A gentleman named Wheat is, yeah. is fighting under Garibaldi. Yeah, one of my favorite characters in this whole Italian-American He's history. from New Orleans. Yeah, a New Orleanian, freedom fighter, kind of maverick, goes over and fights with Garibaldi in Italy and becomes very friendly with Garibaldi. And, and as the war starts to develop here and, and there's this growing sense that the U.S. is going to be fighting a civil war, he's called back and makes a deal with Garibaldi, basically, and says, look, I, I need to muster troops. Can you send me some volunteers? And, and you know, we comes back and puts together this troop. It's the 10th Louisiana Infantry and then eventually the 6th Louisiana Regiment, which becomes, at first, is actually declared the Garibaldi Guard. So in New York, you've got 39th New York mustering as the Garibaldi Guard, and here you have the 10th Louisiana. And these Bourbon troops are aware of Garibaldi as an enemy. So they actually declare, no, 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 we don't want to be the Garibaldi Guard. So they called them the Italian Guard, and eventually they expand into other European nationals living in New Orleans who are allowed, because they're foreign nationals, to defend the city but not necessarily engage. So they create this larger European brigade, uh, Spaniards and French and uh, Irish and, and Italian. Wheat's Tigers become Lee's Tigers, become the LSU Tigers. Yeah, it's a crazy part of the history of this city. And I mean, LSU, what an institution here in Louisiana and in the country, and I don't think people realize that little tie that we have to our southern Italian history. And, and, and oddly enough, Nick LaRocca of Sal Peruta wrote the Tiger Fight song in 1917, Tiger Rag. LSU owes a lot to the Sicilians, <laughs> they I think. Do. Absolutely, yeah. they do. John, I want to thank you for Thanks, being on the show. Oh, it's fun. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with more of Celebrating Culture. Hi, welcome back to Celebrating Culture. We're here today at Jewel of the South with Nick Dietrich. Nick, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be here. This is great. The Jewel of the South obviously goes back to the 1860s, and you guys brought it back. Yeah, Joseph Santini, you know, he established the place sometime in the 1850s or 60s. We're not entirely sure of the exact date, but it was a place that was a resplendent example of saloons in New Orleans for at least 20 years. Now, what's special about Santini? Well, Santini was a very enterprising and creative restaurateur. He was a manager of the St. Charles Hotel, which at one point was considered to be the most extravagant hotel in the States. And after running that establishment, he then opened up Jewel of the South, very nearby on 158 Gravier. At Jewel of the South, he's most famous to cocktail nerds such as myself for being the first person to take an improved cocktail and squeeze fresh lemon juice into it, thus giving birth to gimlets and sidecars and pretty much any drink you have with citrus. You know, we take that for granted. No one thinks who was the first to do it, but there's actually a book about that. Well, Jerry Thomas wrote the first bartender's manual in 1863. He establishes that Joseph Santini was the inventor of the brandy crusta. So Santini, 1860 is also the Civil War. That's why I believe that the crusta is probably older than the Civil War, just because of embargoes and all of the different things that would have come along with the unrest of that period. The crusta was probably invented prior to that period. And during that time, you know, he continued to run his establishment um, until uh, the Confederacy uh, abandoned the city and then the Union moved in and there was a militia called the Italian Brigade that helped to maintain order in the city and it's probable that Santini was a big factor in that uh, they did hold meetings for that at his establishment Jewel of the South and probably at a smaller place the parlor as well and so because of that he was able to really become a more predominant citizen of New Orleans after the Civil War. The Confederates leave and there really is no police force, but the Italians are looked at as most neutral. Mm -hmm. So, the, and there were some other 
nationalities as well that were seen as being neutral. As far as the waves of immigration to New Orleans go, at the time of the Civil War, the Italians were the newest wave of immigration, and thus they weren't really considered to be a faction on either side. And so it made the most sense for them to help to govern the city in those waning years of the Civil War. And as I read, actually in Algiers, there were fires, there were people that wanted to burn the city down rather than turn it over to the Union. I mean, the Italian Brigade is the reason that we didn't lose the French Quarter to another fire in the 19th century. I read that your partner, Chris, has done over one million Million, French 75? He's close. He uh, estimates that in about a year he'll be at the number one million. So we'll throw a party when he gets to that point. The Brandy Crusta, is there anything that's like key? I would say the key is uh, the cognac. And then the fact that there is a nice dry curacao being made, you know, today. Maraschino is a was forgotten component and sometimes people forget the bitters as well. But also like uh, the fact that there was this large swath of lemon you know, the gratuitous garnishing of this cocktail just gave the, you know, showed the flair that Santini had when he was building this, this cocktail, which is why we chose three different types of sugar here. We have the uh, standing black sugar. There's some, there's some pixie dust glitter sugar we like to call unicorn tears and uh, casting sugar and regular uh, domino sugar, sour green. I understand you made a drink for an heir of Santini? We did, yeah, he was here this last week. Great, great grandson. Was we got to make the crusta. Right now I'm preparing the glass for the uh, Brandy Crusta. The Brandy Crusta is the first sugar rimmed cocktail. First we're going to start with some Angostura bitters. Then we're going to do three quarter ounce of lemon juice. Half ounce of this dry orange curacao from Ferrand. Quarter ounce of maraschino liqueur. Ounce and three quarters of the fine cognac. We're using Remy here. And we're gonna garnish it with a full swapping peel of lemon. Just as Santini himself did. There we are. Brandy Crusta. Cheers. To Joseph Santini. Cheers. And to the success of the Jewel of the South. Thank you. I'll toast to that. If someone wants to find you guys, what's your website? Our website is jewelnola.com. We're at 1026 St. Louis Street. I want to thank you for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. And stay tuned. We'll be right back with more of Celebrating Culture. Celebrating Culture is brought to you by Awe News. Awe News also produces New Orleans Insider Tours, which are 10 self-guided tours of New Orleans and Louisiana. If you want to enjoy oysters raised a new way off-bottom, stop by Dickie Brennan's Bourbon House. If you want to enjoy charbroiled oysters, stop by Drago's. Hi, welcome back to Celebrating Culture. We're here today at Andrea's Restaurant in Metairie, Louisiana, and I'm with Catherine Campanella. Catherine, welcome to the show. Thank you, Charles. Catherine, you're a great author. You have seven books, and one of them I found I fell in love with called Lost, about the Lake Pontchartrain resorts. Right, I don't remember one summer of my entire life before Katrina that we didn't spend some time at a camp on Lake Pontchartrain. Those were the camps out by Haynes Boulevard? Yes, Little Woods and Haynes Boulevard. It was just the best of times. Wonderful. Lost tells the story of how the Ustikans, an island just north of Palermo from Sicily, came in and, and really developed West End in the early 1900s. People like the Trinchinas mm -hmm. and the Olivieres. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about this. That was in the 1800s. First there was a hotel and restaurant. People would go out there, gamble, dance, eat, drink, have a good time. The Lake Pontchartrain gets developed at Spanish Fort, and then the people there are not entrepreneurs. They decide to, to go to West End. The railroad came in, they built the resort. Then the Tranchinas came in and built a restaurant, big, beautiful building, and eventually a hotel. At his restaurants, both in Spanish Fort and at West End, they were well known for their great jazz musicians. Armand Piron was the house orchestra for many years at, at Spanish Fort. Louis Armstrong played out there, and Louis Armstrong in 1928 recorded uh, West End Blues, and it is now known as one of the greatest jazz recordings ever. 
people don't know that there was a roller coaster out there. Oh, there was a roller coaster that went out into the lake. They had uh, water chutes that you would slide down into the lake, all kind of water wheels. So this place was so happening that the big celebrities like Mark Twain would mm -hmm. come down and write about it. It was a destination. If you're in New Orleans, you need to go out to the lakefront. The food was world known. They had an opera house, both at West End and Spanish Ford. It's really catered to all classes. There's a resurgence, and we see a lot of great restaurants reopen with Italian influence. Papa Rosselli's, Fontana's, Federico's. And this brings back what we knew in the 60s and 70s and 80s of what may have been the glory days of West End. Today we see that there's still some great restaurants out at West End. Yeah, there's two Tonys. Catherine, I want to thank you for being on the thank show. Thank you, Charles. And if you'd like to, I really recommend going to any place to find Catherine's books because they really tell a great part of New Orleans and Metairie history. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with more of Celebrating Culture. Hi, welcome back to Celebrating Culture. We hope you've enjoyed this episode on the Sicilian migration into New Orleans. Sicilians introduced mandarin oranges, lemons, pasta, so much into Louisiana culture. We hope you're motivated to learn more and enjoy the Sicilian influence on Louisiana culture. Thank you.